so thank you for the opportunity to present this. Uh, this is going to be actually a talk on some of the educational components of uh, working with genomics. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a short course we developed called Sequence of Genome, and it's on de novo genome assembly. Uh, so as mentioned, I'm at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York, and I'm at uh, the DNA Learning Center, where I'm assistant director here. And one of the things that we um, do, uh, well, actually, I guess this is like a list of a lot of the things that we do, is we really try to reach students with hands-on education. Uh, that includes in-person visits to the center for field trips. Uh, it includes uh, our online and multimedia websites. And through all that, we reach uh, somewhere in sort of a pre-pandemic number, but probably not too far off coming back around, uh, you know, uh, 500,000 plus students a year uh, via the, dif the different uh, mechanisms that we have to reach students. One of those is the summer camps, which is a fantastic way um, for students to spend uh, a whole week with us doing hands-on molecular biology. And it's been really popular uh, for many decades now. And if you're in the area, please uh, go ahead and, and stop by. Uh, but the reason for, for doing that, uh, whether it's DNA camp or some of the other uh, mechanisms is really, even though um, some of these recommendations are recent, like the ne next generation science standards, or even going back to um, President's Council, uh, everybody knows in education that really, uh, when it comes to STEM and biology, hands-on learning is, is really, really effective. And so uh, we wanted to uh, teach about genomics by really getting students to do genomics. Uh, and Although a slide aside, stretching out my words, research and education are just two different parts of the same spectrum. In principle, our, our goal is always to give students and uh, the opportunity to work with the same tools and the same data as researchers. So we've done this in a number of ways, and this is work by many of my colleagues at the Learning Center. Uh, one fantastic example that I don't have time to go into uh, has been getting students, especially in our area, but in, in many other locations, to go out and do DNA barcoding where they look at biodiversity, they look at food samples. And um, we've actually had uh, thousands of students participate uh, in going out and sequencing things. Uh, some of that has involved a little bit of next generation sequencing, but we never really attempted to do uh, full on genomics uh, with our students. Uh, and so that was our question, can we do this for whole genomes and get students uh, really working with the, the, the latest technologies and tools. Um, for those of you who remember when next generation sequencing was a new thing, uh, you could go to a conference and people would put a pin on the map when uh, somebody had bought a sequencer and like, ooh, you know, how many are there? Uh, they stopped doing that in 2012 uh, because of what's on the right, that we now have nanopore sequencers. There's other technologies, of course, um, but that, that really enables everybody to do it. So we thought, great, this is going to be our chance. And we tried that in 2014, and the answer was no, not yet. Uh, even though Nanopore uh, is, is what we actually are using right now, back then, it just wasn't ready for the classroom. Uh, and so uh, there are a number of reasons why it just was not giving the results that we need. Uh, just because something is ready to be used in the lab, in the classroom, if you can believe it or not, um, we're less fault tolerant. Uh, so experiments have to work now, and they must uh, be amazing every time. Uh, and that's not how real science works most of the time. Uh, but for students, we want to make sure they really have a positive first experience, uh, not that that experience is a lot of troubleshooting. Uh, other things is that the data quality uh, is important, but also uh, when we're thinking about how we bring this into the classroom, we want to eliminate long and hazardous components. So there's going to be trade-off. We're not necessarily going to get the highest quality possible data uh, because uh, some of the things needed to do that might be too expensive or not realistic for working with students. And then also we need to take in consideration how much computational um, background skills and knowledge are needed for a high school student, let's say in this case. And that's something that we might not think about um, right away. Nevertheless, uh, we put together this course and we actually did it this summer. Um, we were waiting, the pandemic stopped us, but we were able to do it this time. And so our goal was to try to complete a small plant genome in a week, uh, and then also work with, uh, work on a genome that was something that had a story behind it, uh, so the students could be excited by that, involve scientists to actually work on this so that we could connect them to the community, and also generate data that would be useful or uh, potentially reused. 
Uh, so I turned to Twitter to ask people what I should sequence, because that's usually a good thing to do, just ask random people on Twitter. And Alex responded that duckweed would be a good idea uh, to go ahead and try in the classroom for a number of reasons. And we went with that. Uh, it's common, but it's also cool. There are many people working on it, and including at Cold Spring Harbor for bioenergy, bioenergy or carbon sequestration. It's easy to obtain and process. And there was a draft genome available, but there are also, uh, because this plant clonally propagates, there's some strains that are unsequenced. So that means that students could really do something that was novel, um, but not necessarily that we were off on our own with a genome that we had no idea what we were working with. And also, of course, the size was something that we could generate um, uh, easily. So we had 13 students. Uh, most of them uh, are in 11th or 12th grade. Now, they are often students who have come to previous camps or experiences with the Learning Center. So they would have had some experience coming to the course with pipetting. And also some of them may have taken some of the coding courses that I offer, um, which would expose them to Python, uh, working with Jupyter or Linux and things like that. Um, our strategy in the course, first, we did a PCR of human mitochondrial DNA to warm the students up and also to work with a really small piece of DNA and a genome that students could uh, sort of see an end-to-end -end workflow because we knew we we're not going to finish the entire plant genome in one week, but we would get a good deal of the way there. We also had the students extract the duckweed DNA, so we got good enough DNA. We weren't uh, going to get um, million, uh, million base pair reads with this, but it's going to be good enough that every student could participate. Uh, we decided that having uh, the instructors prepare libraries would be the best uh, because there's still uh, parts of that which are too finicky and too expensive if they went wrong. And then the students were able to work with the data analysis. Uh, I think I just sort of mapped that out, oops, uh, that on Monday they got background, uh, they did the whole genome uh, uh, or started to do a PCR of a whole mitochondrial genome. And they started launching their computational tools in Cypress. So they all had their own uh, server basically. And they got some background uh, information. Uh, we used a whole bunch of YouTube videos. And then we also had a combination of live guests. So on Tuesday, uh, we checked the library. We had Alex uh, Harkis, who I mentioned, join us. They did the plant DNA extraction and did some Linux tutorial. Wednesday, more Linux, uh, a talk on assembly. Uh, and also we did quantification and QC of the DNA they provided that they extracted on Monday or rather on Tuesday. Uh, then we did more analysis in mitochondrial DNA. Sarah Goodwin joined us from the Genome Center here. Uh, they worked on assembling or, or ins installing tools that they would need for genome assembly and they worked with some test data. And by Friday, uh, we had more on assembly. They started to see some initial reads uh, generated and we talked about the next steps. Okay, uh, as far as tools, and I'm waiting for my uh, computer to catch up, uh, we did lots of things on the HackMD pad. So we had lots of conversations. The students are great because uh, we had the, a glossary of all the terms. So they were helping write the course. And then also as they needed to do code, we could uh, pass little snippets back and forth of the code. Uh, we had Zoom was integral because we had guest speakers joining us all the time. So students could talk about other, like actually hear from scientists who work on these problems full time and also feel like they're part of it and ask questions. Um, YouTube was really important. So lots of videos that were on YouTube uh, were part of the lecture content and that was great for them. On Cybers, it was amazing because we could instantly click a button and have a shell or have a Jupyter notebook, but something that has you know, 30 or 40 CPUs behind it and a half a gig of RAM, you know, a couple of uh, gigabytes of RAM, like in the 100 whatever you need uh, gigabytes of RAM and size. So that was amazing to have that so they could work with the world data and also GitHub uh, because after the course was done during that week, students continued on and we basically made uh, elements of the course issues on GitHub that they could go through and walk through those instructions as they were doing. So I'm gonna quickly share a two minute video because I'm still within my time from one of the students. I'm actually gonna share my whole screen so that you can see them both side by side. Uh, so give me a second to do that. Share sound, off the clip and this. Uh, our student Griffin, who is from uh, Syosset High School, couldn't join us because he's literally in school right now, but I'll let, let him tell you about the, th the, the two slides that he added there. Hello, my name is Griffin Han, and I'm a sophomore at Syosset High School, and unfortunately, I'm unable to attend live today due to my currently being in class, 
but um, my research interests, um, they lie in biology. Um, I've done projects in the past in bioinformatics, genomics, and I recently completed a project in drug repositioning. And it's really for these reasons that I was drawn to participate in this course over the summer and then continue it afterwards um, to really to get a hands-on experience in de novo genome assembly. Um, as for the course, I thought it was excellent. Um, I thought it struck a great balance between being beginner friendly, but also very engaging and encouraging of personal exploration. And by that, I mean, there were um, comprehensive instructions for each step, but there were still things left out for us to like find out ourselves by looking at GitHub documentation. And so this way, everyone always understood what was happening and why, even if these topics were so far into what's usually covered in school. So Mr. Williams helped us uh, with the assembly every step of the way with troubleshooting or if we ever had any questions. And by the end, I felt like it was a very comprehensive um, introduction to genome assembly for high school students, at least. Um, so without any further ado, here are our results. So we ended up using Redbean for our assembly due to its speed. And I chose 21 for the camera length as a parameter to minimize the number of contexts but maximize their lengths. So the cumulative length plot here is showing that our genome assembly was turned out to be quite close to the reference genome. So by 300 contexts, the reference genome was almost completely covered by our genome assembly. Um, GC content is another metric of similarity. Uh, once again, um, our genome assembly seems to be quite close to the reference genome. Um, finally, we've generated a surface plot of our assembly. Um, pictured here. So hopefully in the future we'll work on improving our assembly with by using other programs as well. But um, until then, uh, thank you for your attention. And so once again, uh, that's Griffin who is a sophomore and uh, is looking for college uh, when he graduates. So for those of you who want to invite him to your uh, institution. So what's next? Uh, we also work with phase genomics to generate some high C data. So we're gonna use that to correct the assembly and try to actually get that published. Uh, we're already working for next summer uh, so that we can uh, do a second round and improve this. And we're working with uh, some colleagues to do an endangered plant genome uh, that's also relatively small. We're working with other colleagues to think about how we can find ways to drive down the cost of nanopore for classroom use. And that cost doesn't just mean money, but the cost of making mistakes and trying to make things more robust and classroom friendly. And we're really just generally in interested in supporting applications for teaching and research at many institutional contexts. So not just a research one, this should be something that every high school student uh, can do. So with that said, I wanna thank uh, in particular our speakers and people who contributed to the project, uh, including my co-instructor Anna, and then also Alex and Sarah who you saw, and then Evan. Uh, from our Teenson lab here who provided materials and helped us with some of the tools. And then also I've been um, from FaZe as well as all of the students who participated in the course. So that said by my clock, I have just a minute left. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll take any questions. Uh, and I'll be happy uh, if anyone wants to contact me, we can share those course materials. They're gonna make them all open in public, but we're still iterating. But in the meantime, we're, we're happy to share what we have. Thank you. <laughs>